next speaker this evening really challenged me last year when she spoke at Soul Free. My life hasn't been the same since. I'm now on a totally different path as I learn more about this amazing God of ours. It has been awesome hearing God's voice, especially as he reveals his secret special name to me, which is what was the subject, was one of the subjects that Jackie spoke about last year. And um, for this, Jackie, I just want to thank you for being God's messenger to me and to so many other women. So it now gives me great privilege and a great pleasure to introduce Jackie Hart to you now. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I've got, you know, visual aids. <laughs> well, it was wonderful, Sharon, for you to share yourself like that with us. And uh, isn't it beautiful how God takes brokenness and makes something beautiful out of it? The strange thing about testimonies is that we all have a story, but we don't all think we've got one. We don't all think it's worth saying. And for many years I felt like that because I was brought up in a Christian home and I didn't go off the rails, so to speak, and so I thought I had nothing to say. But what the Lord did was he showed me that it was his story being worked out in me. His hand was worth telling people about because I'm telling them about him. So that's what my story is tonight. I was born here in the Waikato, out at Narawahia, uh, my dad was the camp director at the Christian youth camps there, so I was brought up on a campsite, had lots of fun, and I had lots of opportunity to learn about Jesus. And uh, by the time I was four, I had given my heart to Jesus. He was my saviour, and I was going to the Narawahia kindergarten. That was good. <laughs> I can still remember trying to get there early, ahead of all the other girls, because there was a special handbag, and we all wanted it. And if I got there early, then I could grab it, and I could hide it. And then when all the girls had arrived and were all looking for it, I could just go and find it and bring it out, and I was the one that had the bag all morning. <laughs> I was in control. So what was I learning? I was learning the importance of a handbag in a woman's life. <laughs> but I was also showing that just because Jesus was my saviour didn't mean he was yet my Lord. And I had a lot more learning to do. We went to Auckland and lived there for a while and then we came back to Hamilton when I was about 11 uh, my dad took up the pastorate at Central Baptist Church, which is still going today. And uh, I finished my schooling here. And then I worked and studied for a while. And uh, I, I ended up going back to Auckland to the Bible College of New Zealand up there. And uh, while I was there, I felt the Lord challenge me about school teaching. The problem is, I didn't want to be a school teacher. I wanted to be a dental nurse. I don't know why that was. I think it might have been the nice, clean, white surfaces and like only one child at a time <laughs> instead of 30. <laughs> anyway, I, um, I felt that if I was going to be in a classroom, then I needed to really know that I was supposed to be there because I didn't want to be looking out the window and thinking, I wish I was in there in the dental clinic. Well, you don't even have them anymore. But, you know, I needed to know that that was the thing the Lord wanted. So I applied for both, and I got accepted for dental school. And then the teacher's college said, they sent me this funny letter that sort of said about, well, we're not sure really whether we want you. <laughs> I said, what is that? So I've got what I wanted wide open, and what I didn't really want anyway, you know, not sure. So I went back to the Lord, and I said, what now? And... Uh, what he said I didn't like either. 
But thankfully, I'd learned to hear the voice of God and distinguish it from all the others. And he said, decline the dental school, and then I'll get the teacher's college to accept you. And that was really hard because, you know, jobs and training is no easier now than it was back then. And uh, I didn't want to. And it was a real step of faith. And I remember, well, I wasn't crying, but, you know, I had wiping tears away as I posted the letter to the dental school. But the amazing thing was I really sensed the peace of God flood over me as I obeyed the voice of God. And that has been a deciding factor in my life when I've had to make decisions in the years to come with marriage, with other jobs, the peace of God. And Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart. Let the peace of God be the deciding factor when it comes to two things and both could be good. Which one do you have the peace of God with? Well, I sent the letter off, and three weeks later, the Teachers College accepted me. And you see, God was at work in my life, teaching me things. The first thing he was showing me there was that when God says he'll do something, he does it. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. If he says he'll do it, he'll do it. The other thing he was telling me was that he knew the future and he had good plans and purposes for me. And as you can see, it's quite helpful that I've been a school teacher, not a dental nurse. And the other thing that I think was very interesting, you remember the kindergarten handbag? I'd got to the point where I was now loving God and his ways more than my own. And I'd learned to let go of the handbag. And I wonder whether some of you here tonight need to let go of a handbag. It might be something that to you seems good. It may be a good thing. But God is saying, surrender it to me. Is it really mine? It might be a relationship. It might be a dream. Can you let go of the handbag? My grandfather, uh, the Reverend John Dean, was a wonderful man of God. He was a Baptist minister and the principal of the Bible College in Auckland. I've got a photo of him, not on the PowerPoint. <laughs> but I thought black and white was OK. You might be able to see that. And uh, he published a series of bedside devotional books. And I'd like to read you a poem that was in one of those. And it was, it was about laying things down. It's called Laid at the Master's Feet. I laid it down at his dear feet, the thing so precious and so sweet, the thing that seemed to me the best, which caused my heart great unrest and turned to take my work again and soothe my deep heartbreaking pain with now my Lord has all. Soon afterwards I heard my name and swiftly to his side I came expecting then some new command or gift of love from his dear hand and heard take this thy life to crown. It was the joy I had laid down, and still my Lord had all. It was the joy I'd laid down, and yet he still had everything. You know, you're in good company. My grandfather struggled with something that was good to lay it down at Jesus' feet, to give it up and surrender it. He didn't know God was going to give it back to him. So if you feel that you're struggling to give something up or lay it down at the feet of Jesus, just remember, God knows your heart and he'll never leave you empty-handed. 
You give him your silver and he'll give you his gold. Well, I went on to um, teach at Melville Intermediate for a while here in Hamilton. And around the time that I turned 40, I began to sense that God was calling me to step out into something new. I didn't know what it was, but I knew, I felt like I was on the edge of a cliff. And I had to jump, spiritually, of course. Um, But I didn't know what into. I felt like I needed to pick up the baton, as it were, from my mum and dad. They were both in Christian ministry, uh, full-time Christian ministry. And uh, and I said that to my mum, and my mum said, well, that's strange, because dad's been feeling like that too, like he needs to hand something over. And uh, so mum and dad requested that my sister and I and our families get together one evening, and uh, they presented to us a Rahui pole, and I've, I've got it here with me tonight, the unveiling. Right, do you want to be my lovely assistant? You can stay here and hold it for me because my arm's getting tired now. <laughs> okay. Um, he actually found this, this branch up in the Hakramata Hills uh, where I was born, up behind um, the Christian youth camps there. And I'll just read you what, what he wrote, something of what he wrote. The Rahui pole was an ancient symbol used by the Māori people of New Zealand A rahui could be placed in the bush or on a path as a sign that the place was set aside and under the complete ownership and protection and control of another. So prophetically, for the immediate family of Fred and Fran Crichton, this rahui pole declares our family to be set aside for the Lord's purposes. There is a rahui over you, warning the enemy of mankind not to trespass into the Lord's possession. And challenged with the thought of passing on the baton of our faith and witness, we've chosen to use a rahui pole in place of a baton. This rahui bears the scars and signs of pruning, as well as the inscription, chosen, called, consecrated, and committed. May these be a constant reminder that we follow the way of the cross, by which we've been healed, and by which we shall proclaim the healing love of Christ. Thank you. And that's my heritage. Do you know what, though? That was obviously what the Lord was wanting me to pick up, and uh, and as I picked it up in my heart, um, he's given me opportunities like this, to just speak to women and to teach them from the Word of God. But, you know... That rod is significant in my home as well. It doesn't just sit quietly in a corner that needs to be dusted every so often and people go, oh, that's nice, what is it? I take that rahui pole, usually on Mondays, because that's the day I pray. Oh, you know, especially. (laughs) I pray once a week. (laughs) When I'm praying for my family... And I lay it on the beds of my children, prophetically. I stamp it up and down on their bedroom carpets when everybody's out of the house. I touch the corners of their rooms. And I declare God's protection over them and the call of God on their life. It's come down through the generations. Nehemiah 4.14 says this, Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons and your daughters, your husbands, wives, and your houses. Fight for them. And that's what I do with that rahui pole. I do it spiritually, not physically. And I think we need to remember to do that as women. We're very good with our words, but we can cut our family members down. We can criticise and we can get into arguments with them. And what we need to do is get into our prayer closets and fight in the spirit realm, not with our words. So the blessings that I enjoyed as a child didn't just begin the day I was born. They were handed down through the generations from faithful grandparents to parents to me. 
Uh, just like the Apostle Paul was speaking to Tim, Timothy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. That word genuine also is translated unhypocritical. And that's interesting. Because one of the significant aspects of my parents' faith was that their faith was genuine. There was no hypocrisy in our family. My mum and dad were the same in private at home as they were in public with their congregation and in the marketplace. I saw no difference. And I felt no desire to go and try all the different things in the world out there because I saw they had what I wanted. I didn't want anything else. I had the genuine thing. And I think our children need to see that sort of faith. That's the sort of faith that will keep your children close to the Lord. That's what I want my children to see. See, God is a family man. He's into families. And the family is the place where he first wants children to get their glimpse of him. The mother and the father both representing the wholeness of God. Well, as you can see, my testimony is the story of God's keeping power. His covenant with my godly forebears who served God faithfully and brought up their children in the ways of the Lord. And just in closing, let me encourage those of you who don't have a godly heritage. You didn't come from a godly line. You can begin a godly line today. There may be alcoholism, divorce, adultery, gambling, poverty, barrenness, suicide, mental illness, Freemasonry. There can be all of those things in your family history. But through the blood of Jesus, you can actually cut off the inherited bondages that come down the generations through those things to you and your children, and you can declare thus far and no further the end of the line of wickedness and the beginning of the line of a godly generation, which can go forever. Well, my story, I'd like to finish just by this verse, Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. My story is about the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. To God be the glory. Great things he has done.